I'm sorry, you can see I'm very passionate about it. Tests for drugs were more important than other stuff because it was seen as such as this big, huge problem. The why me? I know people that have had a lot more traumatic upbringing than me that aren't problematic substance users. So we should say thank you to Neil Woods, shouldn't we, um, off the bat, who's put us in touch. Yeah, sure. Um, did a podcast for our friends at home with Neil the other day. Um, Neil's um, worked prolifically, if that's the right word, in the undercover substance misuse area. And at the end of our podcast, Neil said, you should speak to Suzanne. And that's what we're going to do. <laughs> so I tuned in the other night, Suzanne, to your um, launch of L Leap Scotland. Feel free to correct me if I get, get, if you get the terminology wrong. So Leap is the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Yeah. And my understanding is it's a um, conglomerate if that's the right word or a, par a, a partnership of uh, former police professionals who have recognized that the UK drugs policy is failing am I am I right there yeah yeah sure I mean it, we call it now it's, it's an international organization and and it was started in the USA originally as law enforcement against prohibition which is a, like a nice snappy sort of, you get what it says on the tin, but um, in order to, because of how much drug policy is integral into people's everyday lives, even though they don't realize it, to, to sort of open up working with other organizations and being approached in some ways by other organizations, um, it's been changed to Law Enforcement Action Partnership because the prohibition bit, um, people then think, oh, it's really, really political. It's a sort of anti. And whilst we are against the prohibition of drugs, it, it's, it's, it's so much broader than that. You know, it seeps into everybody's lives, everybody, even if they don't realise it. Um, and so, yes, predominantly sort of ex-law enforcement, uh, criminal justice, uh, prison, probation. And obviously what we would like is, is more law enforcement uh, to speak out who are actually in the job. But that in itself is very problematic due to stigma and uh, the police ignorance, culture. Ignorance, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and fear, It, you know. You know, I'd say even changing drug policy at government level is is dri is driven by fear. Fear. People don't like change. What's the alternative? Um, you know, drugs are dangerous. We can't do anything about it. And it's and it's not. And, and you know, what law enforcement actual partnership do is, as law enforcement, we want to speak out to everybody of why we fundamentally need to change drug policies, you know, internationally, but based, you know, in the UK as well. Yes, let's come on on, on to that, Suzanne. Um, we can also look at how, as a country, we've been misled to get addiction confused with substance use, which are just two completely, you know, one is a mental health disorder or a learned psychological condition, depending on your you know, which camp, which camp you sit in. Mm -hmm. um, and, a, and of course, the other one is a recreational pastime. And, and 
the the powers that be are very good at, at confusing the issue to make people think that if you take a drug your whole life is going to fall apart and of course we you know very unhelpful across the board um mm -hmm. also creates massive amount of stigma not not just for people who want to smoke a spliff on their weekend but also for those that fall foul of of the mental health condition addiction um but can we talk about your how did you get into the police were, were you always going to be a, a police officer uh no not at all i um i originally graduated as a, a pe teacher a physical to take a degree in physical education and i taught uh secondary school years 11 to 18 sport uh, for a couple of years um i sort of joke a bit that i was in a particularly rough school in newcastle and i decided that actually becoming a police officer i might be able to do more <laughs> um not as simple as that it, it, it was just that teaching really wasn't for me i wasn't comfortable doing it and actually my brother-in-law had just joined and i thought oh actually that sounds quite appealing that sounds as though i'd i'd achieve more i think so, you know i could do some good you know police communities keep it safe um and so i ended up applying to northumbria which is quite you know, they, they have a strict application process at the time um and i got in um and that's really where my sort of police career started. I ended up in, so I'm based in Newcastle upon Tyne. I was in Northumbria Police Service. Um, and most people, well, the UK, you know, I was, I was based in Biker, you know, so Biker Grove. But um, so Biker and Walker, which is the east end of Newcastle, which is where I did my two years probation. Um, and then from there went on to, uh, I got particularly interested in um drugs for various reasons um but actually it was in the 90s you know and it was you know, dance culture the raves and all the scaremongering around ecstasy um and you know it, it, there's the term you know like you know was it shooting fish in a barrel sort of arresting people for drugs was quite easy but also it 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 um uh oh what's the word i'm looking for they were more, they were seen as more important the arrests for drugs were more important than other stuff because it was seen as such as this big huge problem um and because of the increase in crime related to it um you know a lot of services did this they created a special operations and i joined at cid and they did special operations um, particularly around drugs. So, you know, the classic, you arrest someone with possession of drug, you're not really interested in that person particularly, but where did they get the drug from? You know, if you help us out, we'll help you out. You know, we'll give you a caution. You know, that sort of bribery, um, getting more information to get the bigger, bigger fish um, was what led to sort of the, the operations that I, that I worked on, collecting information, targeting people and carrying out operations. And with that, um, obviously the huge amount of money that was put into uh, drug squads. You know, at, at the time when I was in the police, you know, I did believe I was doing the right thing. I thought drugs were dangerous and the people that I were involved with, obviously, um, the criminality involved in it and the crime involved in it, I thought I was doing the right thing. And, and, and I didn't sort of start thinking about it till many years later, you know, of that revolving door because actually, if I thought about it, it would have been, this is never ending, you know, this, you know, but sort of for ticking boxes and very much on results and arrests and, and drug arrests, um, you know, as many operations as, as we could put together, we would get arrests related to drugs. Um, so there was a never ending supply of that. And I, you know, at the time I was very young, um, you know, I thought, you know, this is all ticking boxes. This is a success. This shows how good we are. Not really thinking about, um, you know, the supply and demand angle of actually, it doesn't matter how many times I do this, how many X, Y, and Z people in the area I arrest, there is always somebody else to replace that. There's, there's, there's already somebody else to arrest. It's never ending. So, um, you know, like I said, so that, you know, I got into doing, I mean, n n 
nowhere near as in-depth as, as Neil did in undercover operatives, but I did do quite a few undercover operative um, operations, mm. too many operations in that sentence, um, which, again, some people criticise because I know how, uh, you know, PTSD and how it has affected people that have done that in, in depth. You, um, but my sort of involvement of it, um, it, it was quite, ex it was exciting. I found it exciting. Um, and, and, and the thrill of it, you know, of going into a club, uh, taking on this persona, you know, and that, that mm. <laughs> you know, I'm in recovery from alcohol drugs. I was very good at pretending to be somebody else. Um, you know, tracking down who, who, who's doing what, who's, who's supplying what, where that goes to, where they go to in the club, and eventually, you know, leading to a big operation of closing the club down. Um, and this particular club, I think, was it was closed down three or four times within the history that I know um, in in the area. So, um, but again, like saying, it wasn't until, it wasn't until actually I got into recovery that I actually started thinking about what did I actually do? What is law enforcement's involvement here? And that was more to do with um, the people that I see. So, so I got into recovery through uh, mutual mutual aid groups. Uh, it's a 12 step program, it works for me. But what I did find was, it, it, it well, it doesn't, it doesn't for a lot of people. And one of the biggest, um, issues I find, particularly when it's to do with drugs, as in illicit drugs, you know, alcohol is a drug, um, is the criminalization of people that even when they have uh, gone through the, I can't even put into words, the hit, you, well, you know, of problematic substance use, I mean, 24-7, mm. um, you know, you get your life together, you, you, you sort your, basically you sort your shit out a bit, looking at your own responsibility. And then when you try to maybe, I don't go to college, um, get a job, anything like that, criminalization, having a criminal record for drugs stops you. It, it, it cuts your chances down. You know, I can't, there's no studies I don't think I know of that's done of it. it hugely impacts you. Because again, it's one of these things that people don't know, and I was speaking to a couple of people the other day about it, of once you have a drug-related record, that never gets taken off. You know, so things like murder, after so many years, you can get that expunged off your record. Drugs isn't. And, and that's crazy. Why is that? You know, why is that when something you do when you're 20 and, you know, you get arrested and cautioned, stays on your record for the rest of your life? It's, you know, and that's just one little craziness of the whole drug policy scenario. But like you're saying, problematic substance use, getting into recovery, the criminalization is very impactful. Impactful is not even the right word to use for it. You know, it's devastating for people. Yeah. So I'm just um, conscious here, Suzanne, we, we're kind of cover, covering a lot of ground. Yes. Can, can we just take it piece by piece? So. PE teacher, that makes me smile because uh, about five years ago now, our PE teacher from school died. Um, he was called Ash Ashley. Hello to all, anyone that might have known him. He was a wonderful chap. He had two fixed places in life. One was the football field, where I don't think he ran further than five metres that way or five metres that way the, for, for the for the 40 years he was at the school. The other place was at the bar in the pub. <laughs> Every single night, cigarette in hand, without, fa without fail. <laughs> I don't know if this passes the, it, it, in this day and age, but um, yeah, I just, I, I find stuff like this fascinating. Well, I mean, when you've got a job like that, for example, if you've been out raving the night before or, or, or that week, like you don't want to have to rock up and run around a football pitch or, or, or be doing anything that's like, or maybe you do, maybe it's like an easy, easier than being in the classroom or something. But is it, I mean, it, 
it just seems like quite a demanding profession to be a PE teacher. You've constantly got to be dressed in the in the phys rig and you know out out there supervising some sport. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, so my my problematic use of alcohol and drugs didn't come till very much later. I mean, I I recognise now uh, my um, addictive behaviours. Uh, you know, so I was very much addicted to exercise, and it's not, so, so for me, it was very much, uh, my first addictions of choice, if you like, was food and exercise, and they were very much in, intertwined, um, and I was very good at work and play, and I had that line of, so during the week, I worked, uh, did what I needed to do as a PE teacher, but then at the weekend, um, I would play quite hard as well, but managed to get it all together for a for, for Monday morning. My, um, my husband's actually from Middlesbrough, so I was very much um, involved in, I don't people remember Tall Trees, uh, the Kirk, um, the Sugar Shack, very big sort of dance scene clubs. Wow. So and because that was sort of out of my, my teaching area, I could let my hair down and be a completely different person to Monday morning, right, we are doing hockey or gymnastics or cross country or, or that. So, I, you know, I'm, I was very good at, I, I was disciplined. Um, you know, there was, there was a line, you know, there was a line, a moral line, and I, and I didn't cross it at that time anyway. The lines got crossed a lot later on. <laughs> yeah, well, they, so what's the kind of brief then when you're in the station and you've got to go in a I mean, well, do, you have to, do you have to dye your hair or no I mean look, luckily I, I look very different on a night out than I do in a uniform and the rest so um people don't you know even like people that I work with when we started going out on a night out they wouldn't recognize me so that was a really good advantage you know I was good at playing that part and because you know, I was in, in into the dance scene. I knew I didn't do drugs regularly then. Um, I sort of knew my topic, if you like. Um, so I knew how to mix in, how, you know, and, and also, was, you know, it is a lot easier. Well, I found it, you know, as a female, you know, to start chatting to a bloke who's, you know, you, he's, he's on your list, you've got the photograph, that's him, you know, to work your way around, to be subtly... Bump into the, whatever whatever tactic that you that you use to to start a conversation with them, so um, that bit I sort of found quite easy and, and I, you know like I said I, I liked pretending to be somebody else because I never wanted to be me anyway. So um, couldn't, couldn't people tell though that you weren't off your head? Um, God, it was a while ago. Now. No, no, I don't think they did. Um, yeah. That might be because maybe they were a bit more off their head than I was sort of acting. So, um, you know, or I think, I think you know, like saying, I think one time that they were sort of saying, you know, saying along those lines, I just said, yeah, because I haven't taken anything yet. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, because for people listening, and, and, and I should just point out here, for friends listening, we're talking this for the purposes of education, you know. Uh, as a veteran we're in a veteran suicide epidemic so clearly a lot of people out there are leaving the forces falling on their ass with drinking drug problems drink as you hear me say every time is the worst drug right uh, my two two of my best friends drank themselves to to death it's a horrible it's a horrible chemical um but you know we we, we need to shed light in this area if we do what our previous generations did, which is just sweep all this under the carpet, right? All, all we're doing is condemning our children to just further misery and further lack of education, further um, uh, restricting their, their um, opportunities in, in, in life because they're getting sold a narrative that's just not true or, or maybe bits of it are true but it's it's really unhelpful you know when you start suffering with addiction you need to recognize it and you need to recognize it quick you might not be able to do anything about it which was my case it you know I, I knew I was on a ride 
took me on a ride for 30 years, right? I'm, I'm okay with that, right? But what wasn't helpful is I had to do it all on my own because of all the, the no, no one from the previous generation had anything constructive to help me with. Society had nothing. You know, there was like one, I think there was one drug service, Suzanne, you know, and, and basically all they tried to do was just prescribe you onto something else. It, there was no depth of understanding. So again, for our friends listening, we're talking about this for the purposes of education. We don't recommend anyone lives the life that the way that I have or Suzanne has. Um, as I always say, you live your life, I'll live mine, and then we'll be fine, won't we? So, sorry, Suzanne, just gone on another rant there, but <laughs> no, but it is. It's really important, and that's uh, you know, I would love to see harm reduction drugs proper drugs education in in schools and you know and that's like you know you know in school the PE teacher I taught that you know the sex education health education um and we seriously need some harm reduction education on drugs in schools because it's very serious it's and you know one of the things that really annoys me is like oh you can't do that because that's normalizing Drug, drug taking and it's just like we need to get real that taking drugs is normal it has been throughout history ancient greeks there's always been an element of drug taking of whatever that is throughout history mm. what we need to do now is make it safe or like you know i'd say to kids no don't if you know if you've got a choice don't but the reality is that they do so if they are going to do that here's how to be as safe as possible mm. and because of prohibition you know they don't know what they're taking you know all, all of that you know so it, it, it it's you know people need to wake you know they do not it's, it's a bit like you know um same you know from pro problematic substance use and you know 24 end up a 24 7 drinker um you know people don't realize the depths that i went maybe you went to to get what we needed and where we did it that we have kids in school i'm not saying every school every school will have an issue with drugs whether they know that or not it is everywhere and there's always a drug dealer at the school gates there's kids take selling them in the toilets wherever that is happening and we need we're never going to stop that, but how can we make it as safe as possible? You know, educate. Okay, our kids aren't stupid. My kids know so much more than I. We kind of, in this area, Suzanne, you kind of got your hands tied behind your back a bit, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is. It, 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 it's big business. And, and you know, that in, in America, you know, it is, you know, it's profitable to keep your prisons full. And that is, you know, that is seeping into the into the UK as well. And, you know, and I uh, must be clear here, you know, people that break the law, that, uh, you know, violent crimes, they need to be locked up. You know, I'm not saying, oh, we let everybody run free and all the, drug, you know, it, it, it's important, you know, the people that need to be locked up are locked up. But our prisons are full of people that are locked up because... They have an illness and because of that illness is forced them down the criminal route you know it's something like 67 percent of the male population in prison are there related to problematic substance use related crimes it's they, they need treatment help not criminalize and put in a cage where they're just left they're left yes um, let's let's just peel back again. So, we're, we're, when you're in the club as an undercover officer, did you have any, you know, did anyone ever call call you out? Were there any sort of frightening times where you thought, oh my god, we need to get out of here quick? Um, no, I was I was pretty lucky. You know, we would there there were various operations where I was where I was sent on my own, um, which I think were the more scary ones, and they were sort of the ones where. We'd got information on such and such 
people say that drove a taxi, lives here, he's dealing from here, where I'd have to go and call, call cold call. So, um, you know, you get mic'd up and then you literally just sent off to go and call on the door and get information and enough evidence to be able to arrest and charge. In, I mean, I, you know, it was relatively new, although no undercover buying had been going on for a while because of the influx of, of the rave scene and the drugs. Um, it was, oh, I can't remember what I was going to say. It, it, it was getting more more common. Um, and, you know, like I said before, you know, I find I found the challenge quite exciting. And But to be honest, looking back now, what I did... I wouldn't do that today because it'd be very unsafe. So I found myself in a situation where I am in a toilet with a couple of guys getting some coke and sort of trying to pretend to take it, but not take it and then get out again. Um, you know, that was really stupid <laughs> of me, but I was sort of driven by that. Oh, let's get, you know, you know this is, you know, sort of the, the level of drugs, you know, cannabis, XC, cocaine. Also, if he's, if he's got a supply of cocaine, he must have other stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I did put myself in, and that, and that was my choice. You know, that was silly. It was naive. Um, but again, driven by, oh, let's get, let's get the bigger fish. This will lead to the bigger fish, which led me to do an unsafe practice, which, you know, I would not do today. I don't know whether, to be honest, I don't think you'd be allowed to do it today. You know, I'd like to think there's a lot more backup and support for undercover operatives than there was. You know, we did make some of it up as we went along because it hadn't been really done before. Yes, and, and did you have any, um, what, what you'd refer to as successes? Were there any big, oh, big busts? I mean... Yes, we did. I mean, it, it it was the work that we did from the operation is then sort of put into the intelligence pool to gather more operation. And sort of one of the the, the, the bigger ones, and I can't remember the names of people, it doesn't, because there's so many of them, is of we got to a certain level, but we actually had to stop because um, it was an operation that was being led by Interpol, sort of the bigger guys, if you like. Um, and that led to a huge kingpin being arrested so somewhere in Europe, whatever, you know, but part of the work that we did was put towards that. But, um, I mean, I look back and, I, and it, it's, again, it, it's the politics within, within as well, that sort of, you know, we couldn't then arrest these guys that were causing issues with drugs in our area because we had Interpol looking at the next bigger guys in the area. And and then when it got to them, you know, you, you see it on the telly and, it, and it's not quite as dramatic and, and all that, like, but it's sort of like, okay, if you give us this, so the bigger guys, you give us this information on this bigger guy, we will then protect you, you'll get less sentence or, or even you'll get a new identity in another country. You know, the, the people, what I'm trying to say is, so the people, the big, big organised crime gangs, that the leaders or whatever it is, they never actually get um, the right sentence. They, they, they don't actually pay for their crime. It is always the poor guy or woman on some estate, high, you know, high unemployment, it, those though they're the ones that are paying the price for the bigger organised gang crimes. That you know, and, and it's depressing. <laughs> it makes me depressed thinking about it because it's mad, it's, isn't it? To think it's when... so ineffective. It's so ineffective. It's it's like you know, if it was any business, you know, if 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 you looked at law enforcement solely to do with drugs as a business it would never have got past its first five years and here we are you know 50 years later from the misuse of drugs act 1971 putting more money in more resources 
I mean, but the, the police, are, you know what, as well, I have to say, you know, the police are good at catching drug dealers and the organ. We, we're good at it. But the problem being is it's an endless supply. So we have to think smarter. And it's not that we don't have the money. It's because the money that we do have is misspent in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it is, isn't it? It, it? it all, you know, for me, there's no black and white. It's all, it's all, all pretty, pretty grey. Um, and I sort of try, you know, for me personally, what somebody chooses to put in their body on a Friday, Saturday night or whatever, is, is up to them. It's their personal choice. And, you know, this is where we come in just a bit, bit you know, the mis, misuse using substances misuse of substances and for me um if you're putting something into your body out of your choice to pleasure seek because that's what human body you know we're wired for that pleasure seeking time out um does not cause any negative consequences to anybody else it's sort of like fill your boots it's when you know misuse comes in for me is when there's there there are negative consequences to your use of a certain drug um, and you know some of those you know we we learn don't you know that's part of growing up is you know we learn oh i had a bit too many vodkas on friday i've got a minging hangover i won't do that again until next time that might be months later or you know for me and it's a bit extreme but you know for me going out and then the next thing i know i'm waking up in a police cell that's not good you know that you know, but, you know, I know I was in the depth and, and it, it's one of those things. It's like, well, how it is it? There's a very, very blurred bit of when did I step over that line, my own moral line? Um, and, you know, how did I get from here to drinking a bottle of wine a night or whatever to cope with my job, whatever, and, and functioning to a 24 seven drinker that would wake up in police cell that wouldn't know what they'd done. And the only thing that they knew is that I I needed, I needed to switch off again and reach for whatever was around at seven o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, whenever, you know. And that's what people find quite hard to get their head around of like, well, come on. And, and it's like problematic substance use. I would, you know, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It is the, it's, it's, I can't even describe, and, and it is, and I appreciate it's hard for people to get their head around, oh, you know, this thing is willpower, just don't do it. And it's like, if I could not just not do it, don't you think I would? And, yeah. and it's just, you know, the shame, the guilt, the remorse that you have, you know, particularly as a female and with kids, you know, I, I was the worst of the worst in the, in, you know, in the stigma ranking, she can't, she can't even stop doing it for her kids she's a terrible mother it's just like I need help I don't need more stigmatization and to be felt even shitter than I do and people that they don't I don't you know I don't know do they need to get it, 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 it it's that compassion and empathy people need to mm. to try and apply because so go, going back to your, your story Suzanne did you I'm guessing what did you start as a sociable yeah I mean um you know hindsight's a great thing and i look back and i've done a lot of work on myself and out of my own interest you know the whole argument is it nature nurture trauma you know for me um and i wanted the other answers because it was just like i wanted to know why why me the answer is why not me um but also that it doesn't actually matter what i know I know what's fundamentally was wrong with me and I know what to do about it today. You know, and for me, it, it's abstinence based, you know, um, and that works for me. So the, for me, it, you know, I, I, you know, I was a farmer's daughter. I was brought up in the countryside, hated it. Um, the yeah, isolation always, you know, always for as long as, I first can remember I always felt different I always felt I didn't quite fit in mm. you know and it's not you know I had friends you know I was in sports I was on 
teams and all the rest of it. But I just felt this little thing of fear. And if people actually really knew me, they wouldn't like me. And, and you know, it was age 15, 16, when I first started sort of drink, getting drunk. And for me, it was just like, this is the answer. I can have this and I can be this person. I'm not really sure who that person, you know, what I thought people would want to see, want to be. So, you know, I was that loud, outgoing, dancing, I'll stay up all night, I'll I'll try that, let's do this. And it just ticked all my boxes. It made me feel comfortable in my own skin. Um, and, you know, and, and I managed to do that for a long, long time. You know, I, I, I realise now I always, I always drank problematically because I always drank to get drunk. I never, I was never like, oh, let's go out and have a, a little glass of Chianti or whatever it is you, you want to do, or a nice little whiskey. It was like, I'll have that, but I'll need all, the, I, I, I need to get drunk. I don't, I don't do, I don't do middle ground. Mm -hmm. It's all or nothing. And and so if, I, so if I couldn't have anything, A, I probably wouldn't have gone out. Um, I wouldn't bother. But when I went out, had it, it was just, yeah, like I'd come home. I was com Again, it was pretending. It wasn't really me. It wasn't. It was me being uncomfortable in my own skin, trying to fit in, being what I thought people wanted me to be, and all those, you know, social pressures growing up, and and and, and so for me, like, the illicit drugs were not an, an issue. They weren't my substance of choice. I mean, when I went out and I had them, I had great times, but. It, it, for me, alcohol was my um, substance of choice because for me, it. well, at that time, you know, I could just go to the corner shop, get it and come back quickly. You know, I'm actually quite fortunate that my drug use didn't get more problematic because I wouldn't I wouldn't have needed to leave the house at all now. And it would be cheaper, you know, um, you know that's the scary thing, the accessibility of of. Um, drugs and and the variety you know like saying when I was out in the 90s when when, when it was like an XC you know a good XC tablet you know you're talking 10 15 quid now like you know like you're saying you could get probably 20 15 of them um and and as easy as ordering a pizza which is just crazy mm. it's crazy and you know and, and that line that line, like I said before, it, it, it's a bit blurry, but I just, you know, um, mental health issues, um, you know, obviously, like I said, you know, my, my first addictive behaviour came out in eating, so I was bulimic for about 12 years, combined with an exercise addiction. Once I'd sort of got over those, dealt with those, the alcohol came in and, 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 um, because of my low self-worth and because I was a mother and I had children and to the outside world, I felt a complete failure that, you know, once I, you know, and that moral, that moral boundary that we have, right, okay, I'm never going to drink drive. You know, I hated drink drivers in the police. It was like, yes, get them off the streets. I was never going to do that. I did it. I got away with it. I'd crossed that boundary. It was... So, almost like I've let myself down in my own moral gra moral levels. Well, I've done that. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll do it again. And then I did get caught, and and then then once I got caught, the shame, the guilt, the remorse, that just got worse and worse and worse. That I just couldn't face myself, let alone anybody else. That led me to, I just wanted to to numb out. I didn't want a single ounce of reality. I couldn't deal with it. I could not deal with it. Um, and obviously, you know, having kids and all of that just, it crushed me. And, you know, for me, I did, you know, I did, I, I tried to take my own life several times because I just couldn't see a way out. I just couldn't see. And, and, and the help just, it was, yeah, I was just crushed and I didn't, I couldn't see a way out anymore at what point 
did this start to conflict with your work then? Well, luckily, luckily for me, I actually, I left the police force and I wasn't using problematically then at all. And I actually went back to university. I, I went and did a, a degree in fashion marketing. Um, and it was really, uh, when I started my, my degree as well, I, I was pregnant with my first child and, and, and I managed, I managed to spin all the plates and, you know, put myself into immense pressures, you know, going back as a mature student, I'd had my first child, I'd just got married. Um, I'd started, I, I then, I then towards the end of that, of that degree, I sort of noticed, oh, I'm drinking quite a bit, you know, like a bottle of wine a night, but it's okay because I know such and such does that. And it's okay because there isn't negative consequences. You know, I was managing to get up. I was managing to look after the kids, the hat, all the rest of it. Um, and, and I really, I suppose, you know, just like had a breakdown at, at you know, after finishing that degree and then I started going back to work again I started do, go, going back into teaching because that was the easiest thing to do to get some money in with young kids um, and this was the frustration of not being able to do what I wanted to do too scared to do it living in fear um, I don't know what I'm doing it's all too much I'm a crap mum I'm you know I find being a mum is the hardest job in the world it is really hard you know I love my kids and but it's hard I find it hard. I'm not a natural mother um but i'm a much better mother now than, than than i ever was due to getting into recovery and 12 steps and all the rest of it um but just i suppose and i think that's the thing that people don't get all the external stuff that people seem to be able to seem to be able to live you know you know when you're sitting and you watch people go by and you think how do they how do they do that i wonder what their life's like and i'm like struggling and I can't cope and it's all too much. And, you know, when I'm having to medicate myself, numb myself out, I, you know, I, I didn't get how to live. I did. I didn't seem to have that book. Everyone, everyone. I know it's not everyone else because you realize that it isn't. There's so many of us struggling and that's part of the problem because we're all out there struggling and it's getting better that people are t talking out about it. Um, you know, like struggling to be a mum, you know, just because oh, um... we're female doesn't mean that we're naturally capable of looking after kids yeah. yeah hindsight and you know a lot of reading and studying you know I have changed sort of my view on a lot of things and you know for me I I, I understand myself mm. better than I, I ever have done or ever did and I understand you know it's like saying I don't like the words using addict, you know, it, it, it's stigmatizing, you know, so I try to say problematic substance use, but, um, I know that I have to be very wary of substances that, so for example, um, I've got an issue with my back, taking back medication. I, you know, I'm actually quite lucky that, um, the stuff that I can take when I need to take it doesn't affect me because if it affects my head, it's that addictive, ooh, what would two do? What would three do? Uh, so I know that I need to lead. You know, when I say an abstinence-based life, you know, I drink coffee, I smoke cigarettes. You know, I'm not drug-free abstinence, drinking green stuff every morning and, you know, and doing my, my yoga practice. It, and I shouldn't say that actually because that's a bit disparaging. Whatever works for you works for mm -hmm. you. Now, for me, absence based program is the only thing that worked for me. And I do think that if you have an issue, being abstinence from that particular substance for a little while would be very beneficial to look at. So you take the drug away, you're left with yourself. You know, they say it's, it's an inside job. I'm really lucky that, you know, obviously the 12 step program, you know, it's God, it's a cult, whatever. If that's what you want to think about it, that's up to you. For me, I didn't have an issue with God. Um, I'm a more a spiritual person. Um, it works for some people. It's, it's like anything. It works for some people. It doesn't work for others. Mm. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like I can get a bit jealous actually when 
you know, I've travelled to a lot of conferences about uh, product substance use recovery, doing self-discovery stuff of where someone has put their substance of choice down, whatever it be, um, but then they can, so like say they put alcohol down and they can occasionally have a spliff. You know, I'm like, oh, how do you do that? Because my head would, I, I could probably do that, but then I'd want to do it again. And then the next day, then the next day, I, you know, I understand. I know, but I, you know, I know that exactly like you're saying, some people can put that down, absence for a while, get to know themselves, and then they may find that actually they can have a spliff. They can do whatever they want to do. And, in, and you know, for me, it, you know, the, there are negatives to it. Obviously there are, you know, it is, you know, it's once, when someone picks up, uses again and they're lucky enough to get back in and it's, you know it's a one-off or whatever there's no negative you know then it's like and, and then they're so hard on themselves like exactly like you're saying it's like hang on a minute so even if it's like you know you've been in here three months in three months you haven't had anything and this happened and so you, you resorted to you know drinking half a bottle of vodka you know whatever it was that time is not wasted. You know, the time before that, you were drinking a bottle of vodka a day. So, you know, it, it is achievable, but, you know, let's look at actually what it was going on there for you. You know, generally it tends to be, you know, emotional stuff, trauma, childhood. It, you know, unfortunately, it does follow us around. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I'm very open. It's like, so are we are we saying that the twelve step program does recognise lapses and relapses? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they, I mean, they again they do. You know, they call it a, a you pick up a use again. They call it a relapse, and but for me, and and the friends that I have within you know the mutual aid group, you know, we have similar. That's why we're friends because we have similar thinking about it. Of like, you recognise it. But see, you know, for me, I have to, you know, see it for what it is. You know, it's not all that time is down the drain and yes. it's wasted. It's like, so what can we maybe, you know, it's like to say, what can we learn from that? You know, what, what is it that you didn't do? Was it that maybe you, you didn't ring, like for me, like I didn't ring my sponsor in and talk it through. Because, you know, I did something like me, I, you know, I'm like from naught to a hundred and the whole world's falling apart when actually it's you know i dropped a glass uh you know something frivolous is like that but it's you know it's like it's never about the glass you know it's like the hair that broke the camel's back it's never about that it's like all this other stuff that i can recognize that i was building up to and that's just like you know it's all over i want out i want to you know and i still get i still get you know oh god it'd be so nice just to numb out i just want to numb. you know in this pandemic oh my god i you know, it's not that I just stop wanting to use or drink. It's just I know the negative consequences. I know it, it wouldn't work out like it does for other people. Yeah, it just I wouldn't. Get it. Can I? I just want to clarify here for everybody. I'm not knocking the twelve step. I'm. That's not what I'm. I'm trying to highlight where it became problematic um, when I was a substance misuse specialist. Right. Um, and also the other thing was it was the language that I could hear these the 12 steppers using was it just how fucking dare you call me addict you know why don't you call me pilot skydiver best-selling author global traveler podcast host da 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 you know yeah I, I hate I hate the language and it's really difficult I hate the language and I might be well oh, it's not really I was going to and you, and you can cut this out because it's not relevant, but it's just like, I can't bear Russell Brand. Uh, he, the language uh, that he uses and talks, refers to himself about is, I can't yeah. bear him. I, I, just, I think there's a great lesson to be learned there that someone that, that maybe people perceive has got it all. <sighs> Personally, for me, I... I, I and this is not a personal attack against Russell Brand, not 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 in any way, what's the form, but like 
like uh, it's someone that 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 has that much uh contempt for their life experiences and 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 basically themselves it's i just don't see anything good good from it suzanne you know i'm all the stupid stuff i've done with the exception of when i've hurt people i'm very proud of all my life experiences you know um i i i haven't done anything wrong ever right and the reason i say that is you just got to meet my little boy right he's the most perfect child right he's, he's that was ever born in history right <laughs> nature has created this little fella and then gone do you know what we're going to give him to chris rule right that is how perfect my life has played out and that people think they can come in and you know people like russell brand think that i should have changed my life and that i wouldn't now have my little boy it's just it's it's such a weird way of thinking you know it's it it's we we're just a process of you know we're a product of a, of the process aren't we that's um, yeah and it is yeah i'm a product of my parents and their parents their parents and i you know luckily now with social you know so much more stuff being out there you know uh, you know i really um like gabor mate's work on trauma and the link between trauma and problematic substance use um you know but we have to remember it, it it's like you know the why the why me i know people that have had a lot more traumatic upbringing than me that aren't problematic substance users you know they manage to work it out and get through life and deal with life without having to resort to the lengths that I I, I went to it, it you know it's not and it's not that because someone has experienced this level of trauma so whether you know you're looking at you know for example she's like child abuse you know hideous stuff awful awful stuff that should never happen to a child my childhood trauma you know it, it's it's not a competition and I can feel my trauma I can feel as much as someone next to me who has been through a lot worse it, mm. as much if not more than them and it's and that and the, the problem is you know we've we've all suffered from trauma and what we try to do is is numb that pain numb that emotional pain so you know so you know almost like you'd say it gets into competition of well I I trump you with your you know that experience with my domestic violence experience or whatever it's 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 the individual and and we're just we're all people that are in extre extreme emotional pain and. The solution that we had for that, you know, alcohol and the drugs stopped working. Um, and now, 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 because I understand myself more, and you know, to a degree, I'm the problem because I kept putting this stuff into me, trying to get a different result. And actually, it's coming to terms with. And the one thing I always wanted was to be comfortable in my own skin. Um, which sounds a bit ridiculous, but you know that's all I wanted, and for most of the time, today I am, and that's, you know, that's priceless, and I don't have to use a substance to do that. It's, you know, it, it's down that self-esteem, self-worth. Um, I, I deserve a life. I deserve a life as much as the person next to me. Which is when we're in it, we feel that we don't, and everyone else is deserving. And it's not we're all we all deserve a decent a decent life mm. let's talk about the valuable work of leap then um what what is what what would be leap's main aim or aims uh and and aims, how oh, how right. how successful are they being with them right you know so 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 the the end goal you know the you know to win the oscar would be a fully regulated market of all drugs throughout the world you know that's the big aim uh, it would be a great aim to have a regulated market for all drugs in the uk 
um, because what we aim to do is to um, you know, recognise that the drug policies that we have in place have created more negative consequences and harms to individuals and countries than they were ever intended to, that they're not fit for purpose. And what we need to do is we need fundamental change in our drug policies to negate these negative consequences and to help the people that need to be helped and to have an efficient police service again, you know, efficient law enforcement. So the police can go out and get the baddies, as we like to say, you know, the real baddies. Um, and and recognise, I think it, it, it's it's that people use drugs. People will always use drugs. So let's have a policy in place that's fit for purpose. One that protects those that need protecting and gives the individuals the right to put something into their body that they choose to do without negative consequences. Um, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It's not, you know, it's... it's how, how does it fit then with, say, par Parliament? I mean, ha well, have you, you got have you made any inroads there? Yeah, you, you know, you know, in 2016, we actually launched the Leap UK in Westminster. Um, and each year we do sort of an activist day on in June or we have done with a campaign called Anyone's Child. People that have been impacted, you know, their sons, daughters, impacted by uh, drug policies that are in place and um, we are well received by politicians behind closed doors most of the time because they agree with us you know on a one-to-one -one basis they agree they need updating oh they're, they're not okay they're not too sure about the fully regulated market but they recognize the need that the policies need changing and then this is when that you know the fear comes in because they're in a position of power their party they don't want to step outside their party line and they want to win votes so that's when they start sort of drawing back a bit of like i agree with you suzanne you're right but i can't do anything and then that's when i start to get a bit annoyed with them because they can and unfortunately this is the bit where you know when we speak to the general public, it, you know, they agree. Most of them agree. You know, once they've heard both sides of the story and well, how, you know, well, how on earth are you going to regulate heroin? How on earth are you going to do this? You know, once it's explained the system, um, it's like, what can I do? And this is where it'd be like, I know it's a bit of a ball ache, um, but we need politicians. This, this needs to be changed. This is government government level, the Home Office, what we need to do is we need to get the politicians on the side and that's where you need to write a letter to your MP to ask to meet, to ask what you're going to, what you're doing about drug, you know, drug reform, you know, because drug related deaths, the highest in Western Europe, that's crazy, you know, more, more deaths than people killed in car accidents, you know, and, and, yeah. and you know, it's just... It's a horrible death as well, isn't it? You oh. know, it's its not like, you know, dying of old age or something, or it's, or it, it, I mean, even you get run over by a car and killed, that that's an accident. This is people just dying in horrific, you know, watch, see any, watch one of your friends die of liver disease. It's freaking awful. It's, the, yeah, and, and the things that, you know, especially, like you're saying, alcohol is the most dangerous causes, the most costs to the NHS and all the rest of it. And, you know, but with drug-related drug deaths, it, it, it is, and, and like a lot of, of, of um, alcohol-related, these are preventable, the preventable deaths, you know, purely through peer support and naloxone. But, you know, it's, yeah, I like said, you know, I, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It's, you know, um, and the thought of, you know, potentially, you know, one of my children may develop problematic substance use. And I hope to God by then 
they will be in the hands of the health system and a doctor than being locked up you know in a police cell and then and then a prison um and yeah it i i, I get lost for words with it because again it, it's just that um it you know i always say to people as well it's like if you're listening to this if you listen to this that ev everybody will know somebody that has been affected by problematic substance use and they sort of give you a look it's like look okay you you might not actually know that fact about them but your dad's friend your mum's sister your cousin whatever will have someone in their family or themselves suffering from problematic substance use it's it's that entrenched in our society and again with the stigma you don't hear about it because it's the shh, don't you know don't don't tell anybody the shame and the guilt and again that's you know like mental health is getting much better at being talked about but the links between mental health and problematic substance use is i i i personally don't know anybody that sort of in recovery or um in in rooms that have had a problem an issue with substance of, of some sort that does not have a mental health negative mental health it's just like it's like you get the package Mm. You know, I, I, I just have never, ever seen it where there isn't some negative mental health involved. Yes. Can we look at some countries where different things have, have worked? I mean, people often quote Portugal, don't they? Because they've got no no drug law. or, or That's my understanding. Yeah, um, no, so, so it is. It, it, again, this always comes out in debates and arguments of, of um, you know, when we talk about legal regulation, how are we going to do it? what can we do and the solutions that can be um, put into place by by governments um, that would drastically reduce and help you know drug related deaths and criminalization of people that don't need criminalized so one of the examples that always comes up is portugal uh, so portugal they decriminalized the possession of all drugs for personal use since 2001 you know so it's been quite a while and and you know what it, it's for the purposes that they 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 brought that law in, there was a massive opiate death, heroin crisis. Um, looking at so basically looking at the population, we have all these people dying. These people that are dying, they need help, treatment, and support. And the other people um, that are choosing to use drugs, they just sort of need maybe a bit of education, a bit of guidance, um, and maybe a bit of support. So what they did is they said right. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to decriminalise possession. So then, but that, that doesn't mean that you can go around and take whatever you want, wherever you want. Just if you're stopped on the streets and you have your drug of choice in your pocket and it's not deemed enough to be a supply, um, you, you, a bit further investigation's done. So is this a problem? Do you need help with this? Or is this just your, your personal use? Um, and, they, and they're given sort of like a ticket fine and sent to what they call a dissuasion court, which is where there is, again, is it a problem? Again, an opportunity for you to ask for help. And if you need help, you get it. You know, imagine that. Um, and if it's not, um, then, you know, a bit of education, time, place, setting, where you're doing it, what you're taking, all the rest of it. And then you're sent basically to get on with it. So what, but what they did do is they ring fenced a huge amount of money for their health system to, to reinvigorate their health system. So the people that need the help and treatment can get it. So you can get sent to a treatment center, you can get sent to a rehab, um, you know, like a 24 seven rehab. We don't have a 24 seven rehab in the Northeast of England. We don't have one. Um, and for some people, I'm sure like you're aware is that's actually what they need. They need taken out of the environment they're in and put into another environment where they're cared for and they can look after themselves and people can look after them. I mean, unfortunately, the system gets a bit broken because once you've been into rehab and you go back out, if you are then thrown back into where the environment that you came from, the chances of you not relapsing are pretty slim. So I've gone off the top slightly of, of Portugal. So, you know, so decriminalisation is doable and 
I would like to see that in the UK. So basically, 90% of people that use drugs that do so without negative consequences can carry on and do that without the fear of criminalisation. The 10% that do have problems, it would be nice and issues that they would get the help and treatment that they need rather than stuck in a prison cell. Is that much different to hear, though? Um, I mean, my understanding is in the UK, If I mean, if you're stopped by the police and searched and you've got, let's say, just less than a quarter of a hash on you, then they're, they're not going to do anything... I, or, or, or do they still give you a, a caution and that's problematic? You know, this is a slight that this issue in, in the UK. So obviously, um, England and Wales, uh, police police services, and then Scotland's difference, the Scot, Scotland police is separate. And obviously we have all these different areas that um, make up police services, you know, like North Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, Northumbria, Cumbria, and they're all run by the you know, chief constable. Um, and really it goes on what policies the police in their area see they should prioritize. So in some areas you will, uh, so like for example, Durham, it's a very small police service. They have um, a, a, th a diversion scheme called Checkpoint, which is if you, you're arrested with drug possession, you can be diverted to um, health care's professionals and treatment rather than down the criminal avenue. Mm. They that the 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 um, chief constable Mike Barton, who was great, who was very pro drug reform, very dissuaded his police officers. He's like he said, "You're on the streets. I do not want to see you bringing in people arrested for a tiny amount of cannabis for their personal use. I'm not interested. Let them get on with it." But you still get other police services whereby they don't necessarily dissuade them or actively dissuade the rest. They they say encourage. I don't want to say encourage because I you know I can't speak for them. But you know there's disparities between the police services. In one area you could get arrested for a small amount of cannabis, and in others you may not. In some areas you may get cautioned. In others you may get charged. And again, that that's that's the problem is there isn't any um, sort of, there isn't like a baseline that everybody sticks to, and um, and that's and then I mean you know in in London you're eight times more likely to be stopped and searched if 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 you're mm -hmm. black and ethnic minority you know there's those massive disparities that still continue and again go back in history and. and it's, it's on false. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, 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 you know, mm. if you're black, you're going to be, you know, smoking cannabis or whatever. It's just like, it's just all crap. It's all crap that society and miseducation and people's prejudices, uh, which you get in the police, you still get that. You know, I'd like to think it's a lot better than it was. But, you know, it, it, it you know, it's like being in the services, you, you are indoctrinated. You know, you you know you you're you're either in it or you're not. So you either, you know, for me, I was one of the very there wasn't that many female police officers at the time, and you know, and I was very much I had to man up. I had to become one of the boys. You know, I had to be in there in the fights and arresting people um, to be accepted. Um, and you know that that culture. I'd like to think it's not as bad as it was when I was in. I think it is better in some areas, but, you know, I, I quite easily believe that in some it's not. Yeah, got you. What um, what can we say for people then, Suzanne, maybe law enforcement officers that are watching this, if they want to get involved or they have stories to tell, if they'd I mean, like to, su to support LEAP, what, what should they yeah, be doing? So um the easiest thing to do would, would go to the website which is www.ukleap so that's ukleap.org that would take you to the the uk website okay. 
Um, and it would bring up, you know, it's also interesting to go on to um, the Leap USA as well. It's just it, because there's, there's, there's lots of information on them, on both of them, you know, a bit of history about, you know, sort of learning about, about the subject a bit more of, you know, ultimately, if you believe that our drug laws are outdated and you want some accountability and you want them, your politician to change them is to write a letter to your MSP um, saying, I would like to discuss the issue of problematic substance use and drugs in my area. Um, and what I'd say is if, if, if you do that and you've got a, a letter back and you go, oh my God, I, do, I don't know what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do with the politician. Um, you know, there's, 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 co there's contacts on the LEAP website that I'd say, send, just send us an email. I'm happy to talk to anybody about what to say to your politician. Um, and it's not it's not facts and figures. It's the human stories that the important ones, you know, because who, who remembers facts and figures? Um, and do you know what? Even if you if you think regulation, absolutely no way. Read about it, you know, if look, look at sort of um, what's going on in the world, you know, Canada, the, the police chiefs have just backed uh, decriminalization of personal use of all drugs. You know, you have Colorado where you have the, the legalized and regulated market of cannabis. There's all these places that are implementing and changing um, their drug policies to be fit for purpose. Um, and, you know, and it's like you know, we talk about Portugal and, you know, that's 2001. People have no idea, go to Portugal and have no idea that it, you, it's been decriminalized. You know, the sky hasn't fallen in. We haven't got people lying around gouching out everywhere you know it doesn't happen because most people are responsible adults and behave accordingly yes and and um goes back to what we said at the beginning that just because you decriminalized everything or you know maybe you made it like you could go to the co-op and get get substances over the counter from the pharmacy what what for free what it doesn't mean everyone's going to go and do that and and secondly the vast majority of those who do are not going to let that affect their their weekly life you know they're not going to go oh do you know what the government have decriminalized substances so i'm going to go out and get myself a massive problem lose my family lose my because People won't be predisposed to it. Not everyone's predisposed to addiction. This is a myth. You know, this gateway, this whole gateway argument, it's just a myth. People, you know, ch childhood, adverse childhood experiences are the dri generally the driver behind addiction, you know. And again, it, it is, it, 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 it's, you know, that old like, you know, cannabis is a gateway drug. It's, you know, the problem being is, you know, like alcohol is regulated. We need stricter regulation on alcohol, you know, minimum pricing. You can't get it down your local post office, you know, all these things. It's, it's for kids under the age of 18 to get an illicit drug is very simple and no one asks for their ID. No one cares where they're from, what they're doing, how long they're taking, all the rest of it. Mm. It's, there's too much money in it for them. They are very happy to be selling anything to any kid, whatever age, if if they get the money. They don't care. And what would you rather have? You know, a regulated market where you know what you're getting or something that's going to potentially kill you. And to a degree, that's coming true anyway, because the dark web is very self-regulated. Mm -hmm. People might be surprised to hear that, but it's yeah. just buying substances on the dark net is like going on eBay. If you start to muck people around and try and rip people off, you get a bad, people just mark you off as a bad, and then no one will go to you. So it has to be the top quality stuff as advertised, you know, delivered promptly. Um, and if it's not on these sites, so, so I'm told, you, you, 
you raise a dispute, you know, and that person then ha has, yeah, has got three really, days to answer it. I was really surprised, you know, again, I'm open, to, I'm always open to learning new things and having my mind changed if that's what it's, and, and it was a guy called Dr. X who's based in Spain, who does a lot of the dark net sort of research and stuff. And they were, they were, it was a talk on the dark net as harm reduction. And I was like, hang on a minute. And exactly that, that what is happening now is you've got a supplier of this substance and um, and then the reviews on it and then the, and the person supplying it saying, this is how much you take. These are, if you're looking for these effects, this is what it is. You know, you take this amount then, you know, again, time setting that you're in. And, and, and it really was harm reduction trying so that so the person that buys the substance gets the best possible experience which is what you want what they want from they, it they, they get the best possible substance in that, environment. That's... and that sounds a bit like you know i think that'll be a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow like the dark net to do harm reduction but it's like yeah but also they have to do this because of the again the whole legality of drugs you know this is you know and this is information that again harm reduction for students that are out there this is what they need they need to do what they want to do if they choose to do it like say i'm not encouraging it i would say no don't but if you're going to do it how can you do it as safe as possible and always always if anything is not quite right you ring an ambulance straight away you know that that's you know I, you know, I'm not encouraging drug use. It's just, I personally, I had some great top experiences taking drugs. Mm. The rest of it didn't really quite work out for me, but I wouldn't change those experiences. I think like you said earlier, um, people, places, the feel, you know, amazing experiences that have led me to where I am today you know, for me, I now live an abstinence-based life because that's just how I I need to live, you know, that, that, and that's, but that's okay. You know, that's not like, oh, feel sorry for me. It's just, you know what, I had some great times and I've still got those, but, you know, today I lead a, an abstinence-based, well, I say abstinence-based coffee, cigarette, you know, blah, blah, blah. I am not a guru. I'm not. You're, you're still working on those, Susan. Yeah. Come on. Oh, always working. Always working on there. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be all right if it wasn't for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so with somebody else could be the problem. On that note, I'm going to thank you ever so much. Um, fascinating, fascinating chat. Um, thank you for your work that you're doing in, in this area. It, it really is legendary. Um, people don't, the word hero just gets banded around in society now. And it, as a veteran, I can tell you how just misused it is. Mm. You know, it, it's just become so facile to use that. But the work you're doing actually is the hero work. You know, it's what's going to save, ultimately save lives. It's going to enlighten people as to the reality of what what substance use is, what the dangers are, what what you know all, all this kind of stuff that that we just don't really know much about. And then when people do realise that oh actually I'm I'm one of the ones susceptible to addiction, and I'm starting to see they'll be able to relate their experience to this kind of stuff that we're saying. So it doesn't just like for me come as a bolt out the blue it wasn't even like a but it's so it's so what's the word surreptitious you know it's so slow what's happening to him before you know it you're in this world that you don't even know how you got there and yeah. nobody around you went back 25 years no one around me could go chris this is what's happening all they could do is try and scare me get me to change my behavior, tell me I was, a, you know, stig stigmatize it e even more, right? So, so Suzanne, thank you.
thank you. And like, and anything else, Chris, um, just, just give a shout out. I'm like saying, I'm happy to talk and, you know, and it is, and it is that thing, like, you know, it's that slow drip in the bathroom, isn't it? With, with problematic substance use before you, well, the ceiling falls in and it's like, how the hell did that happen? Yes. Um, you know, like saying for me, abstinence base is, is the way for me, but you know, recovery is having a better life than you did before, whatever that looks like, you know, whatever yeah. works for you. Great. Yeah. Well, all the rest of it is experimenting, isn't it? And you experiment to get the perfect life. And then the, the irony is once you get to the perfect life, you realise you don't need any of that stuff. In fact, all that stuff does is just take you down off the natural high and, and make life bloody hard work. And I know. Yes. I'm going to put the links for Leap below our, our video and um, and um, so people can, can find you. Great. Um, massive thank you again thank you for your time as well chris no, nice to no speak problem to you. just just stay on the line suzanne so i can thank you properly to our friends at home massive love to you all please look after yourselves if you can like and subscribe that will be wonderful and we will see you next time